Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2022 Snowtown Film Festival. We're back again this year. Um, we're still virtual at this time, but we're still uh, celebrating some of the great films and filmmakers and everyone that has put some uh, great submissions in this year. And we're looking forward to tonight to our panel discussion, our Q&A. This is our one of our favorite things to do, to be able to really chat with some of the filmmakers and really dive into some of the works that they've submitted to this year's festival. And tonight, um, we are proud to talk about Jack Wyatt and the, the Gun from Hell. And we actually have, let's see, we've got um, writer, director, and editor, Clay Dumas. And we have a couple of the actors. Uh, we have Trevor Dumas, and we also have Jay Story with us tonight. So this is a real good chance for us to really just open up um, about uh, the film and chat about it and talk. Hopefully everyone has a chance to watch it if you haven't. It is streaming on Eventive and you can watch it several times and just keep checking it out and going back. Um, I watched it again today just to refresh and, uh, and and take a look at it one more time, make sure I didn't miss anything as we talk about the film and talk about your involvement with it. So now to reach back and do a little history with us, um, Clay, you, you submitted, I think it was our first year in 2015, submitted uh -huh. a film. Um, that was uh, Hold'em, correct? Yep, yeah, that was, yeah. That was Hold'em. So you've been kind of involved with this in since we started. So we kind of feel like we're all old, old friends here uh, that you were mm -hmm. kind of part of when we first started this. And here we are, you know, the eighth annual Snowtown Film Festival. So we're it's a pleasure to have you all three of you with us tonight. Well, thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. So, I mean, some of the folks watching know you're from the North Country, you're from the Carthage area, but there could we've got folks watching from all over. So could you guys do just a little quick, you know, bio, tell where you come from, where you guys are kind of located now and kind of a little bit of your involvement with the film? Uh, well, yeah, uh, in 2010, I was working at an electronic store um, at the time. And while I was doing that, I was making... I was writing a horror film called uh, Get Out Alive. Actually, the poster's right there. It's behind Trevor's head, but uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> and uh, I knew nothing about filmmaking. I just knew I wanted to make a movie, and uh, that was it. So like, I, I posted stuff on social media to try to get friends to be in it, and that was actually how I met Jay, uh, was actually through Craigslist, because I, I didn't have any other avenue to go through, and I put an ad on Craigslist for actors. And uh, he was the first one who responded. And uh, from there, uh, yeah, we entered that in, that was the Scaricon Film Festival in Syracuse. And then uh, a couple years after that, we made Hold'em, which Jay was also in. Um, and that was, uh, that got into the first annual uh, Snowtown Film Festival. And then what happened after that was uh, a production company out in Colorado saw the trailers for those on YouTube. And uh, my brother lives uh, out here in Colorado, so uh, they wanted me to work for them. And I kind of had this window where I could come and work for a real production company. And uh, so now I'm out here uh, and uh, now I work in uh, advertising, TV, uh, like you name it, I've, I've done it. Um, and uh, that's where we ended up making uh, Jack Wyatt and the Gun From Hell. We did it on the green screen at the studio where I worked at the time. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I mean, to go from, I just want to make a film to getting a film out there and now, mm -hmm. now you're in you're Colorado Springs and you're and pulled in. I mean, that's a that's definitely a great success for, story for anyone that's out there. It's like, oh, I don't know if I can do it. It's like, you've got to jump in, it's start right. doing it and get out there. And now and now today it just feels like there's, there's platforms that are much oh, easier to get, get out there because yeah, between YouTube and you know, streaming and everything that we can do now that any content, I mean, everyone's filming stuff on their iPhones now and, you know, right. short five, 10 minute film and be able to get out and getting, getting eyes on it. Whereas in the past, it, you had to do, you got to go to New York, you had to go to mm -hmm. California, you had to struggle to try to get either a script in or, or a yeah. story you know, written and directed and the money that it takes to do it. And now technology has kind of helped move that, the art of filmmaking into a whole different, different level. Oh, there's so many more tools and avenues now that you can go through. There was like nothing when we started. Uh, and uh, yeah. Oh, also BOCES helped a lot. Uh, we both oh. actually went to BOCES. He went like when the program first started. And uh, I went years later uh, when it turned into like a two-year program. Um, visual communications was the, uh, was the program. Because we didn't have film school out there. That was the closest thing to film school I could get. And that, that helped a lot. So Mr. Uh, Constantino, Chuck Constantino, 
was our teacher and he taught us a, a great deal. Oh, that's awesome. That's a great story. I love it. Do we want to do a coin toss, Trevor, you want to go? Jay, you want, who's up next? Go ahead, Trevor. All right. Um, well, I grew up same town, Carthage, New York. Um, I'm 10 years older than he is. Um, I, I ended up joining the army. I don't, I don't have any film or acting experience other than part of his movie. Um, I joined the army in 98 and um, mm -hmm. it ended up, uh, my first duty station was out here at Fort Carson, Colorado. Um, where I ended up, I deployed, I went to the, the Bosnia region back in the 90s. Um, I was in Korea at the DMZ and I was part of Operation Iraqi Freedom One the first year. Um, but I ended up out in Colorado Springs and um, because of the Army. And uh, when it came time for the end of my contract, I was honorably discharged and I ended up staying, I like Colorado. That's the only reason I really got out. Um, and uh, just the Army, I move you around a lot. Uh, I like Colorado, so I ended up getting out, and I, I wanted to stay here. Um, I like to hunt and fish and do all this stuff here. Um, they have the mountains, and everything I enjoy is out here. And uh, awesome. I've been out here since, uh, well, I've been out here longer than I've been in New York State. Um, and uh, now um, I, uh, I do a lot of artwork. Um, mm. That's one of, his, one of his back there. Um, right now, I'm... Um, he kind of went into a different um, a different field when it comes to profession than me. Um, I'm in law enforcement. I work as a police officer. Um, and that's what I do right now. Wow. Well, I mean, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your service in the military and thank you for keeping us safe. That's that's great. And it's nice having family members and friends that you can grab and throw into your movie because I yeah, I think I, I've been involved with a couple projects where I had some friends that were, you know, starting out directing. We love movies. And yeah, I don't, before you know it, whether you're an actor, you're the boom operator and mm -hmm. you're the guy that goes and helps get food. And you're like, oh, you've got a car. Great. Because we've got a scene. We need a car. So you end up getting involved, but seeing all those aspects and, and helping out, which I think is great that there's always there's always some friends or some folks that are that jump in to be a part of something, which is kind of cool because you get to ride along on that, that journey. So, yeah. The cool. thing is, like, no matter how high you go on the on the on the ladder, it's still the same process. You're still grabbing your friends. You're shooting a text to someone. Hey, can you be here on this day? It yeah. nothing changes. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and from my perspective, maybe you know, from from Trevor's and everyone else, you you get that experience because you're like, yeah, I have no acting experience. I'm like, I'm just I'm here. I'm doing it. But you learn the process. You see how it goes. You watch other people do things, and you just pick up little little tricks and little things, and you learn from the process too, which is always kind of cool that you're. You just thought, yeah, I'm just going to be in the film, but you actually pick up some things and yeah. and it's kind of cool that you can grow from it as well. So, Jay, it's up to you. I'm the old guy of the group, probably the oldest <laughs> member of the group. And um, I probably I got in the military about 10 years before Trevor did. And I did whatever they told me to do when I got out. I came back to Watertown, got married, raised a whole bunch of kids. And uh, I continue to live here in Watertown and work. Um, as far as my acting, um, I found my way down to Ticonderoga and did the Star Trek New Voyages thing originally. Oh, and, okay. uh, cool. I had a good time with that. And uh, once I did that, I kind of got bit a little bit by that bug. And I went off and did, you know, taking Woodstock with Ang Lee. And then I eventually joined the union, did some work down in New York on Law and Order and Pan Am and so on. Um, but I've got to say that you know, when the phone rings and Clay's on the other end, you know, I drop what I'm doing. It's a lot yeah. of fun uh, to go work with him. A hugely talented. And he's managed to find people in the area and just outside the area as well um, that work in his project. And he allows the actor to interpret uh, the characters, uh, how they see fit. Um, he works well with people and, uh, uh, he called and said, you know, Hey, I got something else going on. I want you to, I'd be there. They'd be there in Harvey. Awesome. So awesome. hugely talented. So, and I watched this, uh, this uh, gun from hell. I was amazed this whole rotoscope thing he was talking about. I, I was, it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever you think. <laughs> and uh, when I saw it, I thought, you know, this, this is really slick. The fellow that I was talking to, I'd never met. I have no idea who he is. And uh, we, uh, I probably will never meet this individual, 
And uh, it, it's funny the way this technology does work. I will say though, listening about the technology, there, as much as it's made things easier, there's a little bit lost when people really aren't in the same room. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's a little everything from casting to just acting with other people. There's a little bit lost mm -hmm. at this distance. Um, I I've, sometimes I find it hard to get that transition down. I'd rather be in the same room with people. Um, ultimately, um, but you were you were delivering lines to like a tennis ball on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Clay, you can call yourself what you want, you know, but uh, it, was, it was Clay that was sitting across the table from me in a garage. It was amazing. You know, I think we were there about maybe 30 minutes. That included hellos and goodbyes. So uh, it, it was really something the way he did that. So, yeah. So I'm still here. I'm still looking for projects. You know, something pops up. I'm down in the city when I can be. Clay calls. I'm wherever he wants me to be. That is terrific. That's great. Well, once thanks. Thank you for your service. And um, yeah, I, 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 I've heard that too. A lot of, you know, even like voice actors, you know, they think they just go in and do their voice and no one else is in the room, but they work better when the other actors are there, even though they're physically not on the screen together, but just have some of the bounce the energy off of. So yeah, I can see that with the green screen and everything else being really difficult when you're on your own. And that just seems to be kind of the way of the technology too, the, you know, the huge budget films that you think you see all these giant sets and yeah, they're, they're talking to a tennis ball that's, you know, coming off the top of someone's head or they're in this, you know, the suit with the dots all over them. And it's, it's a whole different thing. And any acting I ever do, I, I, I need all that stuff. I need the costume. I need, I need, it just helps you absorb the character a little bit more, but to train yourself to act without any of that, you know, you're kind of on stage all by yourself and uh, go for it. Yeah, I could see where it becomes much more challenging than being in a physical environment with not only just the actors, but even sets and things like that can, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a challenge. It does help, yeah. Um, Clay, we're gonna come back to you because I, I guess, you know, this is always a question I always have about the, the films is, so what, what inspired you to go this way? So you've done a couple other films. One was a horror film, but now you're switching and now you're going to go to the, the Western type theme. So what was, what was the inspiration to, to take that on and use that, that genre to, to tell the story? Um, I, I really, it's just, I, for the longest time, I've always wanted to do a Western and, uh, that was really, there was no, <laughs> there was nothing else to it. Um, I, at the time, there weren't a lot of Westerns being made. So that was another reason. I just, if I could go back and, and look at like the actual, like, I don't know what you call it, statistics or, or, or the, the actual whatever, uh, uh, Westerns probably are the least popular movie. <laughs> so I might have chosen something else, but I just did it just out of curiosity. I, I just never had made a Western before and I always wanted to do it. No, I think and it was. Yeah, I think we weren't was, even going to do it originally. We weren't going to do it on green screen either. Uh, we were. We had like uh, locations and everything picked out, but it just it just everything fell through. So, well, and it, and it gives it gives it a whole different feel that you're not used to, and it's it is kind of cool. Yeah. At first, like I I was when I first started watching, I'm looking, I'm like, is is that is that real? What 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 was real and what wasn't? I was trying to figure that out, or mm -hmm. whether it was you know. Is it green screen? Is it kind of stylized? It was really, it was kind of cool to try to figure out, you know, looking at the, the tents in the background or looking at certain things. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to figure out that's that's real and how they were doing it first. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, oh, really cool that it's green screen. But then I'm thinking, oh, wait, they're out in Colorado Springs. That that, that, that landscape should be there. But mm -hmm. yeah, I could see where, you know, and, and being out in a physical location is hard to do as well, too, because I'm you're dealing with that weather and time and is it your property and can you film quick and then run off before they find you and but um, yeah, it was it was kind of a neat neat way of of doing it and putting this this film together with with the green screen, which I really really liked. Um, so to kind of talk about that, so I I learned about the term MacGuffin. I don't know if everyone knows what what that is. I know in the film world they know what the the MacGuffin is, but was it always was it always a gun? Is that uh, kind of really like we, we did like five or six drafts and the gun was really that idea was the only thing that stayed the same if you were to read the, the earlier drafts every one was a totally different story um but yeah the having the having like this just possessed demonic gun was always the the 
Quarrels. Quarrels. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's because I mean, you hear the stories like now we know Back to the Future, you know, they had the DeLorean, but that wasn't the original thing. It was good. It was supposed to be a refrigerator or whatever yeah, it is. Sometimes the idea that we see now was not the original take. So I was, I was curious when I'm watching, like, I think they, gone? Changed, they changed that because they didn't want kids to like getting refrigerators or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hang yeah. On. And then something back here. I've actually got. Oh, cool. I've got the gun from hell right here. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'll hold it up. I don't know if you can see it. It's it's all busted and it doesn't work anymore and the paint's chipped off of it. But yeah, we've we've got it back there. <laughs> was, was it actually a real functioning gun or is it a no, prop gun? It was a crappy prop gun that we got uh, off of this replica website. It, it Actually, if you look really closely, it doesn't even have a, a muzzle on there. So for a lot of shots, like when you're seeing the front of the... Uh, the gun we had to digitally add the the hole okay. in the front of it, uh, but no, it's uh, just a crappy. It's metal, but it's just a crappy prop. But it's actually the star of the show. Yeah, right. It is. Yeah, it is. That is that is really cool. I like that. That's and I'm I'm a prop guy, so I love having you know something you know that's that's tangible and, and really cool that you know you can kind of kind of keep. Um, I do have um, we do have some questions that do pop in. Um, on the handy dandy phone. So I do, Margaret B had asked, um, what's next on the horizon for these filmmakers and, and is there a new project in the works? Uh, yes, there is a new project in the works. Uh, we don't have a title for it yet, but we are in pre-production on that. We actually have some concept art from it behind us. Uh, here, let's grab this, we got this guy right here. Um, it's going to be a science fiction movie and it's going to be heavily inspired by the Twilight Zone in the sense that it's going to be very stripped down, one location, character driven, and uh, yeah, the driver has got that. That's another painting. So we're, we're basically, we're designing the movie right now. Um, oh, and we are on about the fifth iteration of the script, and we're gonna get to about 10 uh, drafts on the script, and then we're gonna start, start uh, building, building sets and all that stuff. So, yeah. Um, I have a, another question here. This from our own Terry Brennan. Um, first of all, congratulations on the make, making of the film. Uh, I really love the poster for this film. How did you come up with such a great design? Oh, that, yeah, that's a good one. I, uh, I'm a huge fan of Drew Struzan. I don't know if you, you're familiar with his work. He did uh, a lot of posters in like the 80s uh, for like E.T. and Indiana Jones and Star Wars and all that. Um, I loved his style of, uh, of painting and I, I, I always wanted to make a movie. I, I mean, I always wanted to make a movie just so I could make a poster that looked like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, really cool poster. So yeah, that was the inspiration behind the poster was just, I wanted it to look like a Drew Struzan kind of thing. So nice. That's what I, did. I looked up, he had a documentary where he, uh, he paint he paints a poster from like beginning, start to finish and just describes his process. And I pretty, <laughs> I pretty much copied his whole process so you did the poster i did the poster, uh but i like went step by step the way he did it so oh, it would wow. look like one of his oh, that's cool i obviously you're multi-talented to take out all those those roles but if you have the skills why not why not use them which is yeah. which is great. so i mean that's that's a beautiful it really it's a beautiful poster i'm terry had a question that was on my list but I, I wanted to give him the, the props to do it. So um, yeah, it's, so this was a, this is kind of a follow-up question with me because I love the artwork in the beginning and the opening credits, the end credits and all the transitional pieces. So is that all your work as well? Yep. Yeah. That was, I, I really like that. That was really cool. I love that, you know, the, it just changing over to that to kind of transition to the next scene, then the opening and the end credits. I'm watching, uh, like, I really like the, the style of what you, what you did. It was really cool. Thank you. And that took, I, man, I really appreciate that because that took the longest to do what were the, the drawings and the transitions and the, the opening and close. Well, and, and I mean, and it's, I mean, I, you know, it, drawing is hard enough for some folks, but to do people and to have them transition from the actor's face and then into the, you know, into the drawing, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Or, you know, vice versa. It was really cool the way you did that. So that was one of the things when I'm watching this, I'm like, I, I love the fact of incorporating all of those the artwork in the in intertwining it was really cool. I got another question. Um, yeah. Wayne Landreth wants to know what wisdom do you have for aspiring filmmakers? So someone that's starting out, 
that mm-hmm. says, I think I want to make a film and help them out with some kind of a words yeah. of wisdom. Uh, one piece of advice that I could give would be at least a practical piece of advice would be to start off by making a list of all the cool things that you have access to, whether it's locations, if friend owns a store or has a cool car or whatever, make a list of that stuff and then write a script around it. Great. That's a, that's, that's sounds like great advice. Um, that, that's, that's how you're going to do it. Cause obviously if, unless you got a big pile of money and someone gave you a, you know, a really super nice camera for, yeah. for your birthday. I'm like, you're, yeah, you've got to find out what's, what's available to you. What's in, in front of you that you can work with. You want to um, maximize your production value is, is the idea. So that's cool. Uh, and you, no, don't need, you. you don't need a lot of fancy equipment either. That the other thing is don't buy equipment before you have a good script. Like just focus on having a, a good script because that doesn't cost any money because what's going to happen. What I've seen so many times is like people, buy like all this fancy equipment, lights, cameras, and everything. And then by the time they get the script done, all of that's outdated. There's always, there's better stuff out there. So just wait and don't spend money until you absolutely have to. I still do that now. And even filming it with something that you have now, like whether it's an iPhone or, you know, older yeah. type of equipment and just kind of version of your movie before you even yeah. send it down. Yeah. You get to that next level. So you can have a chance to have something kind of out and then you can, take it, tweak it back. Like, Oh, we can fix this. Oh, we found this. And, you know, yeah. And just at least have some kind of a roadmap already laid out. Exactly. You know, kind of a storyboard, but maybe it's in video and you've got a way of, of building on that. And like, all right, that was the first film and how can we do it better and take on for the next one. So, yeah, I just like with you, it's, I, I want to make a film, jump in there and give it a shot go, go yeah. try it and, and do what, do what you can and start from there. And, and now, I mean, talking about you get good at it is by doing it. You know, and social networking now, like, I mean, if you're, you can jump on Craigslist to get actors, you can jump on any, you know, filmmaker thread now and say, Hey, I've got this idea. I want, how do I, you know, what, what should I use or what can I do? And everyone's talking and helping each other out, which is really cool that, yeah. you know, so there's a community out there to all you have to do is just reach out and they can kind of help you with some pointers. And Oh yeah. And there's far more people doing it now. Like when, when Jay and I first started, it was like, we, we were struggling to find people to help us out. <laughs> now it's like, everybody wants to, to do it, but yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Need we need something to do and get out of the house. And then, and whether it's, <laughs> no, it's virtual, or you can do it in front of a green screen, you can do it right in your, yeah. your own house and figure things out and, and connect people that way. But that's, that's really cool. What was that. interesting though, is when you did your first one, we were running around to different locations. And then when you did hold them, we did almost everything in one place. I mean, what eighty yeah. percent of the film was done around a card table in a warehouse. Yeah, in a warehouse, and that was it. What was that? Where were? Where was the warehouse? That was. Uh, we borrowed a space from Slack Chemical, which one of their sales facilities was right next to where my my father lived, and uh, he went over and asked for me because I was I was too scared at the time to ask like hey can we film a movie in one of your warehouses so he asked and they actually had like an auxiliary warehouse that was like around the corner uh where they kept uh they kept chlorine containers there mm-hmm. yeah and it was summertime so everybody had chlorine so like the whole thing was like wide open and yeah perfect that's really cool uh, yeah like I said you got to use the facilities there ask see if you can use it and a lot of times like you don't kind of envision those places, you know, so if it wasn't a green screen, it was, you know, you're doing a action adventure, you're doing a horror film. Sometimes the location gives you an idea of, Oh, we can change this and modify it to fit this really cool, cool place that we found. So I think uh, in the scripts for Hold'em, it was originally written to be a storage room or something behind like a restaurant or something. And we just couldn't find it. So let's, yeah. I got a, I got another question coming in here. This one's from Brian Stump. Thanks for casting me as Jack's friend. <laughs> hey, Brian. You mentioned there is no film school in this part of New York. Do you have some advice for filmmakers who would like to learn but don't have access to film school? Um, well, you could go to, you could go to BOCES, take visual communications. I don't even know if they still call it that, but the, the program is still going there. Uh, that was great because that taught everything from the ground up like i'm talking about principles of design all the way to video production and 3d animation um there is a lot of there's there are a lot more resources online than when i first started out like you've got what's the one uh, master class are, are you familiar with that 
like oh my god like if that were available when i was starting out like i'd be so much further ahead uh that was that's a great resource and i love that um so yeah it's just like really if you have access to a computer you can go to film school now right and just watch what everyone else is doing and take notes figure things out get some ideas try it on your own see you know how it works yep yeah it's a matter of jumping in there and, and doing that we talked about the green screen and you know certain challenges so was there was there a scene and this this is a question for all three of you really so was there a scene or something in the film that that was just an absolute struggle and then kind of a secondary question that was there a scene in the film that you personally was like uh wow that was really cool that turned out better than we thought, you know, in our heads that came out. So I guess a challenging one, but an, another moment in the film where you're like, whoa, that came out amazing. Uh, all of it was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be honest, uh, I, I probably won't do green screen in this capacity ever again, because it, it was just so much more work than shooting on location. It was yeah. any scene, like look, look at any scene, the number of people that are in that scene, that's the amount of times you have to shoot it. So right. if there's like five people on, uh, in a shot, you're not getting that shot once, you're getting five shots and putting them together. Piecing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just, it took forever. It took almost a year to shoot, which is, is nuts. I, I can't believe everyone's stuck, stuck with it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't think there was a moment really where I was like, Oh my God, that was awesome. Or that turned out great because I was just stressed the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. And then there, there was your scene when you were, uh, he was supposed to be like hiding, hiding behind a tree, like with his gun, like shooting and everything. And all we had there was like some green boxes that he was, he was hiding behind. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So, so Trevor was, was there, you know, a challenge you seen or a scene that you were involved with? You're like, that was really cool. Was there a moment, you know? Not really. Um, a lot of it, a lot of it didn't really come natural for me. Um, one of the things I wasn't expecting was the, what was it called, ADR? Oh yeah, we had to do the the, the voice, the the dialogue in post, yep. uh, because it didn't pick up well in the studio, so he had to do ADR for all of his lines. Oh. Mm. That was that sounded like it wasn't fun. <laughs> it it took him a few takes. Yeah, I assumed everybody had to. <laughs> well, I mean, everyone. It just takes a while to get like in the rhythm, because it's it's like you're listening to yourself and talking over yourself at the same time. So. You didn't say, "Oh no, no, no!" Everyone's got to do it, Trevor. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, and that's and that's the that's a tough thing too. Even if you're on a location and you got a scene and it's perfect, you know, an airplane's going over or a car goes by or yeah. something that happens, it's like that was perfect. Yeah, you that's know. the one thing that like the the when you go a little higher up the chain, you do more of. Right. Uh, is ADR just uh, because it's it's just nicer to have like a clean clean track. For sure. Let's see. Peggy Putnam's got a. Oh, and you want to ask Jay? Oh. Yeah, his. Yeah, hang on. I was going to say, uh, Jay, uh, you were one of the only people who didn't do ADR for the for the movie because yours picked up perfectly. Well, we were working out of your dad's garage. Yeah, it was pretty quiet. Right? So. And uh, of course, in my head, when I did this, it came out perfect. You know, one take, we're done. And. Uh, but uh, when I saw the finished product afterwards, it was it was it was really something. I was amazed, and I've been in front of green screen before, but we had no green screen. I just sat down at a folding chair, and there was a green blanket behind you. Was there? I don't even remember that. All I I've, got, I've still got it in the closet back here, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even remember that. But uh, yeah, we just did it, and then, and that was it. When I saw you know talking to this fellow across the table. It's like, well, th this is, what a job, what a job. Just, just like when he put out his first film, it's like, wow, this is really good stuff here. He's very talented. So, um, yeah, now you didn't, so I could speak up, you know, it was just me. So. Yeah. So, you know, and that's why I like these conversations is to, to learn a little bit more, but I mean, as an audience member and you watch a movie, it's just easy to get lost in the story and, and, and the coolness of it. But then they realize that there's a lot of work that goes into 
pre and during and then after and all these little things that you're like, you don't really think about, you know, or like, oh, they just filmed everyone's there one scene. Maybe they got it in one take. And I think every every actor, anyone that does any voice work wants to nail it in that first take and be perfect. Like, yeah, I got it. But then after the fourth, fifth one, you're like, okay, I don't you know. Apparently it wasn't as good as I thought. But sometimes, you know, you find out that fourth one, you finally got comfortable and, and got into a groove. And that's that's the one that's the, the better one. But I think everyone has in their head. I want to do it once. I want to get, I want the director to be happy with me and get it, get it nailed the first time and we can move on to the next one. But yeah. And those challenges of, yeah, I think as an actor sitting in a, in a folding chair in a garage and then trying to put yourself into the time period and, and get yourself in that frame is yeah, still a, a challenging thing well, to do. So. It all came out perfectly in my head when I was all done. I, I didn't, I don't know what really happened, but it, it worked up here. So, <laughs> it, I mean, it's great. I mean, you guys really, you pulled it off and, and did, did a great job um, of doing that. Cause it's, I can't imagine doing it. So you did, you did a great job pulling it off. So let's see. I got another question here. Peggy Putnam's got a question for you guys. Where will you film your upcoming sci-fi film? Any chance you'll be filming in Jefferson County or are you committed to Colorado now? Uh, probably committed to Colorado. There's a couple sound stages out here that we're going to, we're going to film at. So uh, right. I would like to have Jay be in it as well as a few other people. So we'll probably fly him out. And uh, yeah, so uh, the majority of this is going to be on sets uh, and we've got that all figured out pretty much. So. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. Let's see. Let's see if I got another question coming here. Oh, so I don't know if we talked about the actual, I mean, we talked about the process, but how long, so let's say maybe from we've got the script to filming, to editing, to putting everything together to completion, how long did that take you? Uh, that started as soon as I moved out here. So 2015 is when I started writing it. And it took about a year to write and about <laughs> a year to film. And then it took about two years to do visual effects. So crazy amount of time. Um, um, and, and where you work now, you're able to use some of the, the services and things that were there to help work on the film? Oh yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I don't work at the studio where we shot it at anymore. I, I work for a different one now, but um, yeah, it was like uh, I was editing like stuff for TV and, and ads during the day. And at night, the, we, there was a huge sound stage with like a green room and makeup rooms and like all sorts of stuff. And we, we had access to like the red camera and just crazy stuff that I would never be able to afford. Literally, like they, I think they charge like a thousand bucks a day just to just to have access to that. And uh, really, it was like at the end of the day and on weekends, they were like, "Here's the keys. Just lock up when you're done." It can't so, can't beat that. That's 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 a dream right there to have those facilities. I can't even, yeah, I can't even factor like the amount of production value <laughs> that we got out of that. I mean, it's it's probably somewhere like a hundred thousand or something. Wow. Yeah. Um, so. I know Jay's from, you know, the North Country area and you have some other actors that, that were in it as well. So were they, they're shot, same thing as Jay. They were all done, you know, Watertown, North Country area or. Yeah, we, we shot, uh, well, what we did was we, we, we did all of the Colorado stuff and then did rough edits of those with like little blank spots where, where the, the other people's lines would go. And then I would take that on my laptop out to New York and we rented out Steve Weed Studios, which was in the Paddock Arcade. I don't even know if it's it's still a thing now, but uh, they had a, a nice green screen in there and we shot some stuff in there with, you know, with Dave and uh, and then in obviously in my dad's garage. <laughs> and then I just took that footage and really I was editing on like the plane uh, coming coming back, you know? Yeah. That's cool. That is really cool. Mm. Um, Let's see, do I have any more questions here? All right, so I got a question here. What's the long game? So are you taking the film to other festivals, looking at selling the streaming services or something else? Uh, we, it, we've gotten into about 15 festivals so far. If you go to the Gun From Hell page, you'll see like all the laurels and everything. But um, so we're kind of at the tail end of the festival circuit right now. So probably in around June, July, it's going to be streaming. So you should be able to watch it on like Amazon Prime and all those places. Cool. Um, so we know Jay, Jay's on board for, for anything you've got coming, but Trevor, is it was this a, a one-time thing and you're done? Or are you ready to 
to be the starring role in the next one or you know what's well, I don't what's think I, I don't think I'm <laughs> ready for that I actually enjoyed this um and uh for the next film I'd, I'd like to I'd like to participate in that too um I don't think I want to be the star though <laughs> he's, he's being modest I wrote a whole part for him throughout the whole movie he's like this he's like the number two guy in the next movie I mean, don't don't not do it because of the ADR stuff. I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe they'll write write a story that's you know a little bit more in a comfort zone. You know, something about maybe a military guy or a police officer, and then you're gonna play a cop in the in the next movie. So perfect. I wrote perfect. it just for him. Excellent. That is really cool. Uh, let's see. I'm checking the checking the text which come in. I got to make sure that we've got them here, and we're we're hitting all. Of them. Hitting all the hitting all the questions. Um, I mean, I'm just always fascinated with with the process of these. So, I mean, being being movie folks like we are, it's Snowtown Film Festival. We love the independence of shorts and everything. So, to us, you know, movies are are really part of our life. No matter whether it's you know the blockbusters or it's someone just made a five minute short and they've submitted it. It's just really cool to see the the artistry and the ideas and the stories and the creativity and then I always love the process of how did you get to the how did you get to that point how did you you know deal with all these different challenges and some of the really cool things and then you know where do you go from there so that's always the path that I always try to pull through because I'm always curious on on that because everyone's story is different and how they end their process of how they write direct and a lot of times it's just a director and someone else wrote it someone else did the music and Clay you just did it all. <laughs> There's so much, so much stuff um, that you're talented with. And, and you definitely got a, a, a great brother to jump in and give you a hand and, and people that are behind you, like, like Jay and, and us, we're it just, it's really cool that, um, and we wish you the best of success in the next film. And we're thank you for being a part of Snowtown Film Festival at our first inaugural year. And then back again this year, it's just really cool to have you back. Thank you. Um, it's great. Oh, look at that. Got another question popping in from Julie M. What do you think is the number one mistake that first time filmmakers make? Uh, probably uh, I'm going to touch back on that equipment thing that I said before. Uh, I see so many people like before they even have a script or, or anything will jump in and buy cameras and stuff. And then it's outdated by the time they're ready to film or they'll film. The worst ones I see are the, the reason why a lot of them fail is they they start filming before they sometimes before they even have a script or a good script. I mean, just write, write your scripts, do as many. So what, what's the way I'm trying to describe this? Uh, write until you get sick, like sickening amounts of hard work when it comes to writing, like until you can't even look at that script anymore. Keep doing a draft after a draft after a draft and uh, get as much advice on it as you can. I mean, really be open to uh, to uh, critiques and everything on, on your work because that's the only way you're going to improve. Well, um, Clay, let, me, let me ask you a question. Clay. The other thing too is, is, you know, that the creative aspect, but I think some people forget that whether you're doing it as a short for five minutes or whether you're doing a feature, there's a lot of business behind that. And that's rather cold and it's not very creative at all, but it's very necessary because you could put together something wonderful, but have no idea what to do with it or even how to accomplish it or how to promote it. Mm. Yeah. You have to develop a very thick skin in this industry, uh, especially when you when you make the leap to doing it on a professional level, when it becomes your job. I mean, there are days where like seriously, like the stuff that you see in like the behind the scenes videos and stuff, that's probably like. 10% of the job. The rest of it is like you're going into meetings that by the end of it, you you your stomach is in knots. And it, you got to get used to that stuff. You got to get, you know, turn on your professional brain and, and, you know, jump into it that way. And, and now in the social world that we have now, you put your stuff out there and you're going to get a lot more instant comments, good, bad, and decisive yep. that you have to yeah, have that thick skin. And like, you know what, it's an opinion. It doesn't mean that what I, I mm -hmm. did wasn't great. Yeah, that's that's a hard thing to have to deal with. In the old days, you send it out and, you know, you had to wait for an audience to find it. So you didn't oh, yeah. hear anything positive or negative. Now you're going to hear it instantaneously the minute you you drop it in where they can see it and then the comments start. But um, definitely a challenge with anybody that does anything artistically and put it out there. There's always going to be a critic or there's going to, you know, you're going to have supporters. But 
you got you got supporters here because we we absolutely loved it um the bios that you did for the characters that popped up i'm like the, one of my the first one i think one of the first ones that pops up and it said life expectancy and it said uh -huh. um it's, what's the word that you, you use? It's uh, already exceeded expectations. expectations. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. That was that was really cool. So I think that I got was... that idea from. Uh, did you ever see the movie Feast? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I got that idea from that. I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we like froze and gave like a little profile? <laughs> like, yeah. Well, there it is. And then I'm like, so now I'm like. All right, now I gotta watch and see. I'm like, I, I chuckle. I'm like, that's really, that's really cool. I love, <laughs> I love that. That was really, that was cool. Um, oh, so we got some. So I know we talked um, about your inspiration for the poster and some of the artwork. What about um, filmmakers themselves? So who is your inspiration, or do you inspire to be um, like, or who you know, as you're growing up, who were those directors? Who are those filmmakers? Maybe actors that kind of gave you that bug, like, uh, I, I want to do this? Uh, wow, that's a good question. Um, I like a lot of filmmakers that started out with nothing and, and did everything themselves. Like George Romero was probably the first filmmaker that, I mean, obviously, like, when you start out liking movies, you're going to like Spielberg and George Lucas and all that stuff. That's kind of like the beginner level, like, inspiration. But after a while, when I, I figured out I wanted, that's what I wanted to do, was when I saw Night of the Living Dead for the first time. And I actually got that out of the $5 bin at Walmart. And I remember showing that to my dad and being like, what is this? And he's like, oh, it's a movie about zombies. And I'm like, what's a zombie? I took that home and watched that. It was the coolest thing. And we had dial up internet at the time. So I looked up, like I, I was struggling to find information on how they made that. And like, they were borrowing equipment from like a TV station that they worked at. And that was the first time I saw something it was like, I can do that. And even like the other thing I want to show you, I've got the Dawn of the Dead tattoo on oh, my arm <laughs> because that was just like such a big part of my life was, was that. And obviously there, you know, there's Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. Uh, if you ever read the book uh, Rebel Without a Crew, I mean, that's the journal that he kept when he was making his first movie, like all that stuff uh, really pushed me to, to keep moving forward. I, I think I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the directors that yeah started small. We're using their friends. We're using their, their parents' car and now have become, and they're still doing that, you know? Yeah. You know, I think army of darkness and evil dead and Sam Raimi and all those guys, it's like, you know, like they're college buddies and they're together and you find all these stories that through mm -hmm. the years that they've, they've built something, but they started small. They just, they wanted to make films and they did what you said find what you got in front of you, use it and then do it and then go back and you can fix it and then you can make it better. And then once people see you and realize you've got a talent, you're going to get some money and then you're going to move on and then you're going to, you know, and you can move, move your way up through and, and, and do some really cool stuff uh, yeah. beyond that. So yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Jay, do you have, um, cause you're more of an acting side. So is there an actor that is your inspiration or even a director or what's, what kind of got you into that, the acting portion and wanting to be involved with all this? Uh, well, like I said, I did one of those Star Trek things for a few years way back when, and I did it horribly. And I continue to do things horribly, but I, I do me best. Um, <laughs> I'm more of a nighttime drama, uh, police show kind of guy. I enjoy that a lot. Um, and it just... I, I have a tendency to gravitate towards what seems to be real life. And um, some of the uh, actors that I've met down in New York, uh, the, the deal with them when they do, when I have had conversation is just, just be yourself. Let the director worry about how it's going to look in the end. You come in, you do your lines, you do, you know, I mean, I've simplified it a lot, but a lot of people come in there and they try to be somebody else. They try to be your, you know, your whoever, A-list actor that they happen to, you know, they try to channel that. And some of the best acting I've seen come from character actors, sometimes support actors, because they come in, they have a couple of lines. They're not trying to roll over the star and they're themselves. And they do that enough times. And when they start doing you know, lead roles and whatnot. They've already developed that. I'm just me. This is what you get. 
Yep. So, and I think it's a good good basis to start from is be yourself first, and then you get in a comfortable where you can get out of your comfort zone, try something else. But you've got to be comfortable with you first before right, you can. You can you can come in and you can you can pretend that you're. Uh, one of your favorite actors or actresses when you start, but as the scenes roll on, you're not really sure how that person, that other actor might handle this and you find yourself a little lost. And then you start hearing the words in your head and you shouldn't be there. So you just do your own thing. So being involved with Ticonderoga and, and the Star Trek thing, was there anybody, any, any brushings with, I know that Shatner's been out there before and, and Robin Curtis and some folks from the Star Trek world have been out there. Any through that, any brushings with some of the celebrities in the Star Trek world when you were doing that? Well, um, early on, because he started that in uh, 2003, um, Shatner's basically guest starred when he opened up that uh, whole museum thing he's got going on down there. And uh, we were I worked with uh, George Takai, uh, not George, but uh, Walter Koenig and Nichelle Nichols. David Gerald directed one of uh, the episodes. And, um, you know, these these folks, I just, I stood back and I watched them. Just, I just watched them and they would come in, they would do their lines. And when they walked away, the person that was in front of the camera is exactly the person that's, you know, grabbing a sandwich with you. And we're just, you know, talking about sports, talking about politics, talking about whatever they was on their mind at the time. So, um, and when I went to, when I got down to New York and I was doing Law and Order, which was definitely a different animal in of itself, um, it was the same thing down there. These people came in. When we had lunch together, you talked to them, you observed them. But then when you saw them on set, you saw essentially the exact same thing. And being that I was either support or you know background at that time, I stayed out of the way. I was there when I needed to be, I, you know, and I just didn't get in the way. And I was, you know, you say, please and thank you. And sometimes they come up and chat. Sometimes they don't. A lot of people on set and the big budgets, you know, they, they run their, they run their budgets by the second, you know, it's hundreds of dollars a minute and more. So you don't want to upset anybody. So. Right. Yeah. I found just like Clay said. You know, he, he watched the fellow with the, the posters that he likes to do. He, he observed what was going on and, you know, Night of the Living Dead and so on. And you looked at that and you said, I can do this. And Clay's done it in his own way. Yeah, so. I, I think that's that's great advice. I mean, to be yourself, to really watch and, yeah, and, and spend the time, not go in and do your scene and then leave, but watch everybody else, pick up cues, pick up stuff. But and it's always good to hear that story because, you know, we've heard so many not so nice stories about actors and famous people that they do their thing and they're not genuine when they come off the set. They do their thing and come off and, you know, they're a total different personality. But to know that that's the, the thought of that person that you see on screen is the person you envision in real life and they really are. And that, that that's always a beautiful, beautiful connect with, with people when you, when you see that. So to learn that from from them is, is really cool. It is. Uh, Margaret B has a question. So what are the pros and cons of writing a screenplay by yourself? So this one's for you, Clay. And uh, pros and cons of writing with, with partners and, and extra folks. Mm. I mean, that's a tough one. Uh, I try to, to involve as many people as possible in the, in the writing process. I mean, in every draft that I do, I'll send, I'll email a PDF out to whoever is willing to read it and give advice. But I, I think you need to learn to develop a, a really good filter uh, of what you think should be in the screenplay and what you think shouldn't. Um, definitely don't write alone. At least like tell people about what you're writing. Um, yeah, uh, as far as the, the, the pros of writing alone, I mean, in my opinion, there are none. <laughs> it's it's a painful process for for me uh, writing. So, uh, yeah, I I uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> it's just painful for me <laughs> to to, to yeah, get. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah, everyone's process has got to be different. But you know, yeah. some people are like well, I've got to do it my own until it's done, and then let someone look at it. But 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you're not, if you need that, it's just good to have that feedback to know, like, that's not, where is that going? And be able to take the, the criticism and, and oh, use yeah. it. Yeah. And you can't just be alone and be in your own little echo chamber because once you put all that work into it and then finally you let people see it and they, they you find out they don't like it, then, oh, it hurts so much worse. <laughs> so who in your, who in your inner circle? So you, you start writing, who do you bounce things off of and who do you get feedback from? Uh, this guy, this guy. Uh, and really I like to send it to whoever I think is going to be in it. So, uh, Rodrigo, who was in, uh, who was in gun from hell, he's going to star in the next one. So he's been, I, I send him every, every draft and he puts his notes and stuff down. And, uh, my friend, Derek Jones, who's probably one of my oldest friends, I send him all my stuff and, uh, he gives me a ton of feedback. Um, yeah, I just, I send it to people who are like really close with me. So. Nice. And people that will give you the, the honest feedback is, yeah, yeah no. They, they, oh, no, great. They, great. They, job. You're like, no, I want, yeah, I no want problem that. tearing my stuff apart. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, and that's what you need. And now, but also to know that it's coming from a good place and he's trying to, yeah. you know, help. He just wants, out. he wants the product to be better. That's it. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome. Uh, let's see. I got another question. So Brian, Brian wants to know what your desert Island movie flicks are. So the ones you would take on an Island. So not Castaway, not Gilligan's Island, but what, what are your three top, top movies? So everyone have one of those, I guess your favorite movies that, what are, what are those top three? Oh, don't ask me that. Such a hard question. That is a tough I can't question. Answer that. I like so many of them. <laughs> we won't hold you to it if you change your mind tomorrow, but. <laughs> Uh, probably, you know what? The top one for me is Jurassic Park because that was like the first movie that I was ever obsessed with when I was like six or seven years old. Um, really for the, the other two would be like probably a horror film, uh, maybe Dawn of the Dead. And I really wouldn't care what the the third one is. It could be anything. The problem is I watch so many movies. Like I watch them while I'm like working and everything. And I just run through them so many times that like, I would get sick of them like way too fast. Uh, I mean, I love them, but like, I would get, just get sick of watching them. I'd want something yeah. different. <laughs> Maybe they'll send the third one to you FedEx or drop it off on the Island. So you can just have your, <laughs> have your two. Um, Trevor, is there, what, what are your, what are your three? You got three movies that are kind of in your top shelf. I know it's a, this is a tough question. I wouldn't be able to answer this either. I don't really watch movies very much. Um, Young Guns. I know that would be one. Okay, Young Guns. <laughs> I, I always like that one. Um, uh, see, I kind of like the movie Lawless. That's that's more of a modern or more modern movie. Yeah. Yep. Um, Anything with like uh, Gerard Butler would be good. Like uh, you, you like Machine Gun Preacher. It's a pretty good movie yeah. too. Yeah. Well, I thought you were going to say Young Guns too, but you didn't add that one to the list. No. <laughs> All right, Jay, what what are your top three? Since you had more time to think about it than everybody else. <laughs> yes. Um, I enjoy things like uh, I enjoy Three Hundred. Mm. Um, from you know, and and well, believe it or not, things like The Exorcist. We're going to run horror movies, but there's a backstory to those. Those are the types of things I like. Um, they're not just something that were jumped up in a room um aside from that i couldn't really tell you um i'm a nighttime drama person yeah. i'm a huge dick wolf fan um between law and order and chicago series and so on and the guy just he's he's hugely talented for nbc he really is so awesome. and i and i like his uh, character development and the the people he puts on there so yeah, it's, a, it's always been a tough question, even if you said what's your top 10, because it, it, it changes. I mean, but yeah, anything that's just something fresh, something new, something that, you know, came out that you weren't expecting that you're like, yeah, like 300, you know, no one had seen anything like that for a while. And you're like, oh, this is different. I like I like what they're doing with it. And, and now a lot of the graphic novel stuff, I'm tending to to, to slide to that stuff because it's like, wow, this, I've never seen this before. It's a brand new story. There's no there's nothing that was reminiscent from another another film, which reminds me, I think we had a question that I may have skipped. Um, oh, yes. With like a big inspiration for Gun From Hell. Yeah, that, I, I could see that. Yep. 
you can see that in there. So Bill, Bill P wants to know, are there any movie cliches you'd like to use playfully in a future film? Mm, I probably accidentally use them a lot. Uh, but I, I don't really plan that out when it happens. It, usually if something like that happens, it's like it, we notice it on set. We're like, oh, we'll just leave it in. That's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that, that wraps up our questions. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. One, for all the hard work you put in to the movie um, and spending the time chatting with us tonight and talking about it. This is, the, this is the part that we love to really just dive in and chat with you guys and get a one-on-one -on -one conversation and learn more about the film, learn more about the process and just learn more about, you know, the filmmakers, the actors and everyone that had, had a piece to this. Um, we wish you the, the best of luck, but Clay, can't wait to see the, the rest of the stuff you've got coming. Trevor, thank you. Jay, thank you so much. Thanks for the, the stories, the chatting. Thanks, um, and we wish you the, the best of luck at the Snowtown Film Festival. And we hope to see you at the next one as soon as the next film is done. Um, we hope to be back in person one of these days and we'll, uh, we, we look forward to that as well. So thank you once again for being here tonight. And for everyone else, uh, get on there on Inventive. Enjoy the films. Check everything out. Support all the filmmakers that we've got this year for our 2020 Snowtown Film Festival. Thank you very, very much.